Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Bienvenue to the webinar on climate change. So the code of conduct and the instructions on using the chat and the Q&A are over in the chat box, if you haven't seen them already. And my name is Catherine Hayhoe. I'm a climate scientist, and I will be connecting the dots between climate change, the pandemic, and our health. Now, I know there's probably a few people still joining, so let me introduce myself very briefly and give you a little bit more information on where you can find more to follow this webinar. So I study specifically what climate change means to us in the places where we live. So often we think about it as a global issue that affects future generations or people who live far away. But the reality is it is already affecting us in the places where we live. When they survey people asking them, what information would you like to know about climate change? And a Yale public opinion survey just came out yesterday actually on exactly this topic. It turned out that people were saying, we want more information on impacts, how we're affected by climate change. We want information on solutions, what people are doing to fix it. And we also want to know a little bit more about the science. So that is what I try to do with social media. So let me just share my screen with you for just a second here. Um, I am on Twitter. You can easily find me on Twitter. I am also on Facebook, I am on LinkedIn, and lastly, I am on Instagram. And on each one of these places, probably Twitter mostly, but I try to do this in the other places as well, I try to share information on the science, the impacts, and the solutions to climate change. So if you are looking for a source of information, I would recommend these different accounts to you, and especially on Twitter, I have a list of over 3,000 scientists who study climate on Twitter. So there is all of the information out there if we want to find it. But today I'm going to be speaking to you specifically about how climate change is like Pandora's box. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be having a dialogue together on this and this is how we're going to do it. On your computer or on your phone, go to pollev.com slash Texas Tech. I am Canadian, but I am a professor at the university in Texas called Texas Tech. So go to pollev.com slash Texas Tech, or you can go to pollev.com and then enter Texas Tech. If it asks you to enter your name, don't worry about that, just push skip. And I'm gonna go ahead and ask you your first question to make sure that you know how this works. What day is it today? Is it April 254? Is it May something? Or is it 21 or 2021 yet? All right, so far people are doing pretty good. 100% of people. Oh yeah, a few of us <laughs> think it's next year already. I'm kind of in that group C, I have to admit. Sometimes though it does feel like it's the 300th day of April. All right, it looks like you're getting the hang of this. You can see this is updating as, we, oh, there's, yep. Thank you. There's at least one or no, there's a couple of people who are still stuck in April. Yes. All right. Now, more seriously, I want to ask you this. Where are you tuning in from today? I used a global map because although obviously this webinar is being hosted in Canada, um, we can be joining from anywhere in the world. So I see a few people have very fast fingers. Excellent. Um, really, you're actually in the Northwest Territories. That's incredible. Okay. A lot of people from the Southern Ontario area, Toronto, Ottawa, um, BC coming in there, a few from the States, one from Brazil. Excellent. Okay. It looks like we're just missing some representation from the Yukon. Anybody from the Yukon out there? I'm not seeing your dot coming up there yet. But other than that, we're looking pretty good. Okay, so now you know how this works. So I'm just gonna ask you a few questions as we go along um, to give you a chance to respond to the things that we're talking about. And don't forget that you can also pose questions. Carol is gonna be moderating the questions. You can send the questions to Carol. There's instructions in the chat and she will post them in the Q&A and we'll have about uh, 15 minutes to take questions afterwards. And of course, if your question isn't answered, you can also reach me on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Instagram, as you saw before. All right. No matter where we live, though, on this map that we just looked at, we all live on the same planet. This planet is our home. And we as humans are not capable of floating around in outer space without the resources that this planet provides. We are 100% dependent on our planet for every aspect of our physical life. Our planet gives us the air that we breathe. 
you take a breath right now, recognize that comes from our planet. It gives us the water that we need, the goods and materials that we use to make everything that we have from the chair or the desk that you're using right now to your home, to the computer, and of course, our food as well. Now, there's a word that people often use to describe people who care about our planet, and that word is environmentalist. So if you go to Google, which is, of course, the arbiter of modern opinion today, as you probably heard, we're remembering less and less today because we can literally just Google it. If you go to Google, they define environmentalist as a person who is concerned with or advocates for the protection of the environment. Now, here's my next question for you. If you had to describe an environmentalist in one word, what would it be? Now, if you have to use two words, you can cheat slightly, but just make sure that you use a dot to connect the words, okay? So if you're gonna say tree hugger, for example, tree dot hugger, or tree hugger, all one word. Um, if you had to use one word to describe an environmentalist, what would it be? And as you can see, this is a wordle. So the more people answer a given word, um, the bigger the word. Um, so far, we've got excellent words. Realist, I like that one. Responsible, caring, worried, yes, passionate. Advocate, that's good. Mm -hmm. Holistic, yes. Green, mm -hmm. empowered, that's good. Equality, oh, I like that. So responsible, a few more people have said that. That's why that word is getting bigger. Green's getting a little bit bigger too. Life, yes, absolutely. Sustainable, mm -hmm. okay. Oh, an ecologist, I like that too. Caretaker, yeah, forward thinking. Mm -hmm. Systems thinker, yes. Excellent words, I like these words. Okay, so based on these words, I'm quite sure that you are gonna feel the same way that I feel when we look at the words that Google uses because right below the definition for environmentalist, it has words. So here's the words that they come up with. Um, it's similar to a conservationist, a preservationist, an ecologist, we saw that one on the list, green, saw that one too, or nature lover. So far, so good. But then they have a second row of words. And here's what the second row of words looks like. Eco-activist, eco-nut, eco-freak, <laughs> tree hugger. These are not so good. So then I Googled images. You know how you can Google images, right? So I Googled images of environmentalists. And these are the first eight images that came up. So what did we, what is the perception communicated by these images? Well, first of all, the perception is that an environmentalist, someone who cares about our planet, has a 100% chance of being white, has an 88% chance of being male, Rachel Carson there is the only woman on the list, has a 60% chance of being dead, yes, I made sure to check every one of those, and has a 50% chance of having truly impressive facial hair. This is the stereotype of an environmentalist. But given the fact that every single one of us lives on this planet, that every single one of us depends on this planet for everything that we have, given the fact that our health depends critically on the resources of this planet, if I were able to put a giant red X through this definition, I would. And the definition I would offer is simply anyone who lives on planet Earth. Who cannot care about the health of our planet when the health of our planet is our health? Every single one of us, no matter who we are, we really do want clean air for ourselves to breathe and our loved ones, people we care about, our community. We want clean air to drink or clean water to drink even though we take for granted that it exists. We want a safe place to live. We want meaningful work to do. We need to feel like we can make a difference. We can support our families. We can contribute to society. And here's the interesting thing. What threatens this? The coronavirus pandemic threatens these very basic needs, whoever we are, whatever part of the world we live in. And so does climate change. Specifically, why do we care about the pandemic? We don't care about coronavirus just because it exists. It exists in bats and it does not harm them. Coronavirus actually has a symbiotic relationship with bats where the bats do not die from coronavirus. They carry it and they're healthy mostly. 
So if coronavirus existed, but it only existed in bats, which many more strains of it do, do, we only have one strain of it in the human population, there's many more strains of it in bats. But if it only existed in bats and it didn't harm the bats, would it really matter? No. And if the average temperature of the planet were increasing, which it is, this is data showing the increase in the average temperature of the planet, um, it is in Fahrenheit, forgive me for that, because I got this from the National Climate Assessment in the United States, which I was a co-author on. But if the only impact of a changing climate were to increase the average temperature of our planet and nothing else, nothing else, would we really care about it? No. We care about the pandemic, we care about coronavirus, and we care about climate change. Why? because it affects all of the things we already care about today. Like what? Both the pandemic and climate change, they threaten our health and our safety. And not just ours, but that of our families, our friends, our loved ones, our communities, our cities, our provinces, and our countries. Both of these affect the economy. They affect jobs. They affect resource ability. Uh, availability or scarcity. They affect national security and more. Both the pandemic and climate change are profoundly unfair. They disproportionately affect people who are already sick, the very young, the very old. The poorest and most vulnerable people both here and abroad are most affected by the pandemic and by the economic consequences of the pandemic and are also most affected by the impacts of a changing climate as well. Both of these issues are threat multipliers. Where did this term come from? It actually comes from the US military. They labeled climate change a threat multiplier because nine times out of 10, or really more like 99 times out of 100, it's not creating a new problem that didn't exist before. It's taking a problem we already have and exacerbating it or making it worse. I care about a changing climate, not because it's increasing the average temperature of the planet by one or two or three or even four degrees, but because that massive amount of heat being trapped inside the climate system is affecting what? It is affecting our health. It's affecting poverty. It's affecting access to resources, our food, our water. It's affecting inequality. It's affecting stability and refugee crisis. It's affecting the winter snow. It's affecting our seasons. It's affecting the character and the nature of the places we grew up in and, we, and that we live in. Climate change is a threat multiplier and it is affecting things that every single one of us care about no matter who we are and no matter whether we realize it or not. So here's my next question to you. What threat does climate change multiply that you care most about? And I don't want the same answer here, I want different answers because we're all different people, right? And so the reason why we care is all different. It doesn't have to be the same reason. Go ahead and answer while I'm talking. But so often we feel like everybody has to care about an issue because of the reason I care. That's not true. All that matters is if we care, but we could care for different reasons. So two weeks ago, for example, I did a webinar with Burton Snowboards. Why do winter athletes care about climate change? Because it affects the availability of snow, right? But then you talk to people who live in marginalized communities who are already struggling with poor health care and lack of access to clean water and pollution. Why do they care? Because it's making them even harder to get the clean water and clean air and the food that they need. And then you talk to people who work with homeless people in the, in the streets of Halifax. Why do they care about climate change? Because homeless people are most vulnerable to the impacts of a changing climate. And then we look at issues like the pandemic, which are exacerbated, the process by which diseases jump from animal to human populations, exacerbated by habitat fragmentation, by biodiversity loss, by reduction in overall habitat area, by climate change changing the places where animals can live and the food availability to them. Why do we care about a changing climate? Every one of us has a different reason. And I love the diversity of these answers here. What have we got? We've got inequality, water, food, biodiversity, our health, future generations, our kids, our work, indigenous peoples, fertility. Yes, we care about it for different reasons and that is 100% okay. We already have the values we need to care about climate change. We don't have to instill new values into people. All we have to do is connect the dots between what we already care about and how climate change affects that. All right. 
Not only that, but again, climate change is a threat multiplier. This is a diagram from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It specifically relates to climate change, but it could, it could really relate to almost any disaster. So you've got weather and climate events over there on the, on the left-hand side, but you could have the coronavirus pandemic over there too on the left-hand side. What do we have? We have the fact that disaster is a function not of one thing, it's a function of three things. It is a function of exposure. What is exposure? Exposure is the number of people or valuable infrastructure or things that are exposed to a disaster and the exposure is going up. We've got almost 8 billion people in the world. We're building almost $4 trillion US in, in new infrastructure every year around the world. We have more and more and more at risk every year. Our exposure is going up. At the same time, in many places, our vulnerability is going up. In inequality, socioeconomic inequality is increasing. Our infrastructure in most of most developed countries is crumbling. Our vulnerability, unless we are deliberately acting to counteract that and build resilience, in most cases, our vulnerability is increasing. And then, of course, we've got the fact that climate change is increasing the risk associated with many of our weather and climate events, making them stronger or more frequent. All of that adds up to greater and greater disaster. Another way to think about this, I like to give you multiple pictures to drive the point home. Another way to think of this is just to compare images of what happens when the same type of event happens in different places around the world. Some of which place, people are less vulnerable and some of which people are more vulnerable. So you might remember a few Junes ago, we had a massive rainstorm in the GTA. And this is a picture of the gardener flooded. And it was a huge flood and it created enormous damage. When the same flood happens though in Southeast Asia, a year later in September, a third of the entire country of Bangladesh was underwater during the monsoon season. And of course, is a monsoon normal? Yes. Is a third of the country being underwater normal? No, it's because in a warmer atmosphere, there's more water vapor there for storms to pick up and dump on us than there was 50 or 100 years ago. So the warmer it gets, the heavier our rainfall gets and the more devastating the impacts. If you've been following the news, you know that hurricanes are getting stronger and more damaging in a warmer world as they're fed by warmer oceans. And today, one of the strongest hurricanes ever recorded, not the, but one of, is bearing down on Bangladesh again, where people are much more vulnerable. We had a drought a few years ago, this past decade in Texas, and the severity of the drought was just the same as the severity of the drought that hit Syria. But in Syria, that drought was happening on top of a pre-existing internal refugee crisis, on top of pre-existing poverty, inequality, injustice, lack of access to water, civil strife and instability. And you put that drought on top of all those events already happening and it is a threat multiplier making a situation much worse, the same type of event. For example, there was a hurricane, Hurricane Matthew, that hit the Carolinas four years ago. It caused catastrophic flood flooding, billions of dollars of damage, it killed 28 people. But that same hurricane, the exact same hurricane, had hit the island of Haiti, the poorest area of all of North and Central America. It had hit Haiti just before it hit the Carolinas. And in Haiti, they already had cholera. Color is transmitted by polluted water. In some places, 90% of the homes were destroyed. Their agriculture was destroyed. The cholera traveled through the polluted areas. They, in some areas, they lost everything. So climate change is a threat multiplier and the more vulnerable we are, the poorer we are, the less resources we have, the more vulnerable we are, the harder it hits us. Another way to think about it is this. We pour money, effort, time, everything we have into bucket to try to fix things like poverty, disease, hunger, lack of access to resources. But there's a hole in the bucket and the hole is climate change and the hole is getting bigger and bigger. We care about climate change because we care about all of these other issues. And we know that climate change is already making them worse. A study that came out this past year from Stanford University showed that climate change has already increased the gap between the richest and poorest countries in the world by 25%. It has already happened. And this past summer, the United Nations warned that climate change threatens to undo the last 50 years of development in global health and poverty reduction. So we look at the sustainable development goals. And these are so basic. I mean, who doesn't want an end to poverty, zero hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, clean water, affordable and clean energy, decent work? Who does not want these things? 
But down there at number 13, you have climate action. And please bear with me and don't be offended here. Try to understand. I don't actually think that climate change should be on this list at all. Why? Because the only reason we care about climate change is because it affects every other item on this list. Climate change puts at risk poverty reduction efforts. It puts at risk efforts to eliminate hunger. Climate change directly affects our health. Climate change contributes to disruptions that eliminate the ability for people to go to school. Climate change disproportionately affects women and children. Climate change pollutes our water. Climate change could certainly be fixed by affordable and clean energy. Climate change affects economic growth. Climate change is a threat multiplier. And if I could redraw this figure, I would put climate change as an arch over this or perhaps under this showing that the reason we care about climate change is because of all of these extremely basic sustainable development goals that every person in the world deserves access to. That's why we care about a changing climate. How does it affect our health? Just a few examples here. How is climate change a threat multiplier? How does it affect the SDGs? Well, it affects our health in at least eight different ways. We often think only about the heat-related illness and death, but in fact, climate change also makes our weather disasters like cyclones, hurricanes, and typhoons uh, bigger and stronger and more damaging. It increases the risk of heavy rainfall. It makes our droughts more intense. It increases the area burned by wildfires. The heavy rainfall can contaminate uh, our water. The warmer it is, the faster the chemical reactions happen that create air pollution. We also know, not coronavirus, because it's transmitted by humans, but we know that diseases that are transmitted by carriers like flies or ticks or mosquitoes are expanding their geographic range as the planet warms. We know that as carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere increase, plants grow faster, but they still have the same nutritional content. So you have a much bigger plant, but the nutritional content is much lower because the plant grew faster with only the same amount of nutrients. So our, the food quality is going down. It won't affect us so much in rich countries, but in poor countries, it could be devastating. All of these things affect our mental health. And perhaps the biggest way climate change affects our health is through resource scarcity that increases the risk of conflict and refugee crises where very basic health care goes out the window. Becoming, a, you know, becoming pregnant, having a baby becomes a life-threatening condition under those circumstances. We know that climate change also affects our agriculture. This shows the projected changes in agricultural productivity in a changing climate. The yellow and red means decreases, but we know already that since the 1980s on average, per year, we have lost $5 billion worth of crops per year since the 1980s due to the impacts of a changing climate. And the majority of those losses are occurring in countries where people live off one or two dollars a day. We know that the vast majority of people live in coastal areas. Two thirds of the world's biggest cities lie within a meter of sea level. And we know that sea level is rising, displacing people. But sea level rise is only one of many reasons that could lead to massive refugee crises, whether it's thawing permafrost and coastal erosion in the Arctic, whether it's sea level rise or exposure to hurricanes, cyclones, or tropical storms, whether it's areas exposed to desertification and drought, the risk of refugee crises that dwarf the Syrian refugee crises is enormous. And it's already happening. First Nations and Native Americans are on the front lines of this here in North America, whether it's people who live in the Gulf of Mexico or people who live on low-lying islands in the South Pacific or people who live up in the Arctic. They are already having to leave their homes because of the impacts of a changing climate. So that's why when it comes to climate change, I would argue, and also we see these same patterns playing out with the pandemic as well, I would argue that one of the most dangerous myths we've bought into is not the myth we hear so much about in the news, the myth that it's, you know, science is somehow optional, although that is a very dangerous myth. And we see the exact same myth being touted by the exact same actors related to the pandemic as we do to climate change. The myth that first of all, oh, it's not real, or it's not a big deal, or, oh, here's a solution that doesn't actually work, but everybody should do it, or, oh, it's too expensive to fix it, we just need to open the economy. We see the exact same patterns being repeated with the coronavirus pandemic as we do with climate change. 
But all the same, when we look at the most widespread myths, one of the most dangerous ones we bought into is that none of this stuff matters to me. Habitat loss, biodiversity loss, deforestation, pollution, climate change, they're distant issues. They only affect future generations or places that live far away. I'm going to show you a series of public opinion maps. I have more of them for the US than I do for Canada. So I'm going to show you the US ones first to make the point, and then I'm going to show you the ones that we have for Canada. And you will see this myth clear as day. So first of all, if you ask people across the United States, do you think climate change is actually happening? Anywhere that's orange is more than 50% of people say yes, and the darker orange, the more people say yes. This is looking by county across the US. You say, yeah, I think it's happening. And then you say, do you think it will affect plants and animals? And people say, yeah, I think it will affect plants and animals. The whole map is orange. Will it affect future generations? Yes, people mostly agree it will affect future generations. How about people in developing countries? So not your country, developing countries, other countries. We start to see a little bit more blue here, but it's still largely orange. And then what about people in your country? Do you think it'll affect people in your country? We start to see more blue, right? So yeah, plants and animals, future generations, people who live far away. But then when we start to bring it home, we're like, oh, probably not, nah, maybe not. But then they ask one more question. This was a kicker. Do you think it will affect you? This is the problem. The vast majority of people think it's real. They think it'll affect future generations and people live far away, but the vast majority of people don't think it affects us. Now we don't have all these maps for Canada, but we do have this one. Do you think climate change is already harming Canada or will within the next 10 years? So we actually do have most of us are over 50%. Here it is um, not by county, but by riding across the country. But then they ask people, do you think it will harm you personally? And it turns out that pretty much unless you live in Quebec, for some reason, we don't think it will harm us personally. Even though we have already in these very places lived through bigger areas being burned by wildfire, massive flood damages, record-breaking heat waves, thawing and eroding coastlines, rising sea levels, um, increasingly stronger and stronger hurricanes reaching further and further north. We have already lived through these things like somehow we don't think it matters to us personally. Because when we look at images of a changing climate, what's the number one image we typically see? An animal that even in Canada, very few of us have seen in the wild in real life. And if we see images of people, often those images are of people who live far away from us, whose lives are very different than us. But the truth is this, our impact on the health of our planet is already affecting us here and now. It's affecting us through climate change, it's affecting us through habitat loss, it's affecting us through biodiversity loss. We are pushing the boundaries of our planet in multiple ways. This is a concept known as planetary boundaries. We are pushing the boundaries in multiple ways and the integrity of our biosphere up here on the top, the integrity of our biosphere is one of the most critical, although climate change is increasing rapidly. Climate change is right there beside it. I don't know if you caught this, but the timing was unreal. In the second week of March, WWF Italia, which of course, you know, Italy was one of the countries most devastated by the pandemic. In the second week in March, WWF Italia released a report talking about the loss of nature and the rise of pandemics. And they specifically discussed how the chances of viruses passing from animal to human populations, which is how coronavirus got to the human population, it, it lives benignly in bats. It was likely passed from an intermediary animal, perhaps a pangolin, then from there on to humans. They are increased by what? By the destruction of natural ecosystems, by the illegal or uncontrolled trade of wild species, and conserving and maintaining nature and the benefits it provides is essential for what? For our health, because we live on this planet, every single one of us. They talked specifically about how deforestation plays into this, and deforestation also contributes to climate change. They talked about how climate change increases the risk of um, animals' habitat shrinking and have, not, have them not having enough food available to them. And you put together the fact that people still trade in animals, and all of this increases the risk of, it, of these diseases jumping from animals to humans today. But climate change and fossil fuel use affects our health too. 
Just as an example, one of the cheapest ways to get coal in the United States for the past century has been to cut the tops off mountains. But as my friend Marianne Hitt writes here, when you cut the tops off mountains, it pollutes the very waters of the people who live and work in those industries. It allows toxic heavy metals to leach into the water supply, leading to higher incidence of cancer and heart disease, kidney disease, birth defects, and more. We know the impacts of oil and gas extraction, and we've seen the vivid images of their impacts on ecosystems in the Arctic and the Gulf of Mexico and more. But in many countries where environmental regulations are nowhere near what they are in North America, some of the biggest impacts are on human health, on maternal health, on unborn, on babies, on children. In fact, in the Niger Delta, the impacts are so severe on human health that there's an entire Wikipedia entry just on the impacts of oil and gas extraction on human health. And deforestation and air pollution are also responsible for massive impacts on our health. Did you know a few years ago, they estimated that air pollution kills over 5 million people a year. And then just last year, they had to update that number to almost 9 million people per year. Almost 9 million people die from air pollution every year. And we don't even talk about those numbers much. Not only that, but the poorer the neighborhoods we live in, even here in North America, the more likely we are to live in areas that are polluted from air pollution. And here's the connection to the pandemic. It turns out that if our lungs are already damaged by air pollution, we are much more vulnerable to contracting, to getting very sick from, and even potentially to dying from coronavirus if we were already made vulnerable by air pollution. As an example, in the city of Chicago, 30% of the population is African-American, but 60% of the deaths are African-American, and they believe that air pollution is a big factor contributing to that. The bottom line is this, the planet's health is our health. You don't have to be an environmentalist to care about the coronavirus pandemic. You don't have to be an environmentalist to care about climate change. We only have to be one thing to care about these things and frankly to be an environmentalist and that is a human who lives on planet earth and as far as i know we are all that now just turning for a minute to the pandemic if you've been reading the headlines there is some slightly i hate to call it positive but some slightly a, a slightly good news in this you know devastating news that surrounds us every single day and we have seen that the pandemic has slowed our air pollution. In some of the most polluted cities, not just in Canada, but around the world, we have seen massive reductions in air pollution. And interestingly, one study estimates that it's possible that these reductions in air pollution in some of these very polluted areas, like in China, could have saved just as many, if not more lives than were lost to the pandemic. That's not to say that that's a good thing. Any life lost early is, is, is too high a price to pay but it just shows us that we're not even looking at some of the things that are responsible for millions of deaths a year that are directly under our control. And I don't know if you saw this study, it just came out yesterday. You might've seen the news reports. This is the actual study, it just came out yesterday. It showed that government policies, the reduction in industry and the reduction in personal transportation has decreased carbon emissions during the month of April by about 17% compared to what they were a year ago. This study finds that um, less than half of it was due to changes in personal transportation, more than half of it was due to changes in industry. But they say, you know what, as the pandemic passes, these emissions are going to jump back up again our average CO2 levels are still gonna increase this year even though emissions are going down. Why is that? It's because climate change is caused by the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere we have been adding to for centuries. So in a Twitter thread, I broke this down and I'm just gonna share the highlights with you here. I broke down how we have been adding a brick to the pile so the brick is our carbon emissions every month, and the pile is the CO2 in the atmosphere that's causing climate change. We've been adding a brick to the pile every month since the 1700s. And that brick has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Canada is one of the top 10 countries responsible for the size of this pile. Yes, we are in the top 10. 
The number one is the United States. The number two is China. Um, the number two would be EU if you put all the EU countries together, but if you divide them up, they're, they're less than that. And Canada is in the top 10 in terms of contributors to this pile. So we've been adding a bigger and bigger brick to this pile every single month since the dawn of the industrial era. And for the last two or three months, we've been putting a slightly smaller brick on the pile. So adding a brick that is slightly smaller for a couple of months is not going to fix the pile. We have to stop putting bricks in the pile and then start taking them away, not just put slightly smaller bricks. As the pandemic passes, carbon emissions are likely to bounce right back up again as industry does its best to make up for lost productivity, income, and wages. So the slowdown in the carbon emissions is temporary at best. So then you might say, well, does that mean it's totally hopeless? If shutting down the global economy, pulling kids out of school, throwing people out of work, if such draconian measures to alter human behavior as we have all experienced around the world the last two months aren't enough to fix climate change, what is? Does that mean it's hopeless? No, actually exactly the opposite. Now, the pandemic is not likely to reduce our carbon emissions long-term for one simple reason. It's because these reductions were not achieved by sustainable changes. Sustainable means we can maintain them long-term. You can't keep kids out of school long-term. You can't throw people out of work long-term. We have to achieve these changes sustainably. What are sustainable changes? Sustainable changes are efficiency, re, um, using less energy, changing our behavior so we don't need as much energy, doing things virtually as opposed to in person, for example, and getting our energy from clean sources that don't produce heat trapping gases. What are the solutions to climate change? The solutions to climate change include efficiency. A study that came out just uh, six months ago in the U.S. estimated that U.S. emissions could be cut in half just through efficiency, and efficiency saves money. The cheapest source of energy is the energy that you never use. We also know that behavior modification matters, and a lot of us have figured out that, you know what, Meeting each other face-to-face -face is, is ideal, but it saves a lot of time, it saves a lot of money, and it saves a lot of carbon if we do a lot more virtually than we used to. We also know, though, that there's clean sources of energy that don't produce air pollution, and they don't produce carbon emissions either. And 2014 was the first year when new installations of clean energy around the world overtook fossil fuels. Today we are over 70% of new energy being installed around the world is clean energy. Of course in Canada we've been leading the way for a long time. Over 60% of our electricity comes from hydro. In fact that's why we call it hydropower. But we know that this revolution is happening around the world, especially in some of the poorest and most vulnerable places in the world where they didn't have access to fossil fuels. Clean energy is transforming their lives. Project Drawdown is a fantastic resource that lists over 100 solutions to climate change. Some of them you might take for granted, like obviously solar photovoltaics, but some of them might surprise you, like bioplastics or the education of women and girls, biochar, conservation agriculture. The solutions, the practical, beneficial, viable, positive, sustainable solutions to climate change are all around us. And that's what gives us hope. And here's something that might surprise you. Our emission reductions due to the pandemic are not sustainable. They are large, but they are not sustainable. They will bounce back up again as the pandemic passes. But if they had been achieved through sustainable methods, they would have been enormous because we wouldn't have just been temporarily reducing the size of the brick. We would have been permanently reducing the size of the brick. Just to give you an example, to achieve a one and a half degree target, which is the target of the Paris Agreement, one and a half or two degrees C, to achieve a one and a half degree target, it's estimated that we would have to reduce our global emissions about 40 to 50% by 2030, and then 100% by about 2050 to 2060. Well, if the changes that we had seen today were actually sustainable long-term and permanent, we'd be halfway to our 2030 goal in six to eight weeks. That is incredible. So what this shows us is when disaster is staring us in the face, when we recognize that something affects every single one of us in the places where we live, as the pandemic does, and frankly, as climate change does too, we can act. 
and our actions do make a difference. They have the potential to make all the difference in the world. So climate change is a threat multiplier. There is no question about that. But climate action is action for the health of the planet and the human race. That's why no matter who we are, no matter where we live, no matter what language we speak, no matter what side of the political aisle or what party we affiliate ourselves with, no matter what we care about, we already care about climate change. We just haven't connected the dots. And that's why in my mind, the most effective image of climate change is not a polar bear sitting on an iceberg. It is this image. It is us on the metaphorical iceberg. We are all on this iceberg or this planet together. And that's why we care about this issue. And the truth is what the pandemic has showed us is our actions do make a difference. We can act, we can fix this. There are solutions to climate change in our hands and there is the hope of a better future. What can we do about it? I'm not gonna give you my TED talk. This is your homework to take with you. The most important thing we can do is talk about this issue. How do we talk about it? Not by banging people upside the head with it, you know, hitting them upside the head with the science, but by talking about why it matters to us and what we can do to fix it. Because it turns out, according to the science, talking about it matters. Talking about it makes us know more about it. The more we know, the more concerned we are. The more concerned we are, the more we wanna talk about it. Talking about it really does make a difference. Who's the best person to talk about it? You. People who share our values, friends and family, people who speak a common language, every single one of us is the best person to have that conversation about climate change. So I wrote this article last year for Chatelaine magazine. It's still online, you can check it out. How do you actually have these conversations with, with people so that they will listen? It is possible and that is the most effective thing that each one of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we live, no matter how old we are, having those conversations about why it matters and what we can do to fix it is the biggest thing that every single one of us can do. Thank you. We have um, a good 15 or 16 minutes now to talk about your questions. So if you had asked a question in the chat, please go ahead and move it over to the q and I'm gonna open the Q&A up right now and start taking your questions. Here we go. So um, great question. Are the reduced emissions from not meeting in person significantly lower to powering a laptop? The answer is huge yes, huge. So a number of years ago, I stepped on the carbon scales and measured my carbon footprint. If you haven't done that, I do recommend it. And I found that the biggest part of my carbon footprint was flying. Not on vacations, flying to scientific meetings and project meetings and to talk to people about climate change. So I decided that I was going to consciously transition at least 80% of the talks that I give to online virtual talks already long before the pandemic started. And we actually ran some experiments where we tested people before and after they attended a video talk versus an in-person talk. And it turned out it made no difference in terms of people's opinions and, and how they changed as a result of hearing about why climate change mattered and what we could do to fix it. So I had already been transitioning about 80% of my talks to virtual talks because the difference in the carbon footprint is massive, orders of magnitude different. And when I do travel, what I do is this. I collect as many invitations as possible in one geographic location, and then I travel to that location and I give anywhere from five to as much as you know, 30 talks and panels and events in a week. In fact, the pandemic caught me in Ireland when I was in the middle of giving 18 talks and lectures in 11 days. We've been planning this trip for over a year because it takes a long time to line up all these different events and coordinate them. I was halfway done when the pandemic hit. And I do this specifically to minimize my carbon footprint when I travel such that the carbon footprint of each event that I do is similar to if I just got in my little hatchback plug-in car where I live and drove an hour or two away to give it. Um, so yes, doing things virtually online really does make a difference. Um, Beth asked, how do we condense climate science research to ensure people understand climate change and its evidence? Well, the interesting thing, Beth, is that the most important thing for people to understand is um, it's real, it's us, it affects us, and we can fix it. So talking very specifically about how it affects us and what we can do to fix it, those are the two most important aspects of a conversation to have. So what I would recommend, Beth, and um, Kate, if you don't mind doing this, putting this in the chat, I would recommend give my TED Talk a watch, first of all, number one, um, and then please check out our YouTube series. We have a YouTube series called Global Weirding. 
and I will put this in the chat too. Um, it's called Global Weirding, and the website is globalweirding series. Dot com. There we go. And one of our most popular episodes is um, if I just tell people the facts, surely they'll change their mind, right? And that explains how to have effective conversations. And then we also have one episode specifically on what climate change means for Canada. We have other episodes for what it means for different parts of the US. So Beth and others who are interested in how do we have these conversations about climate change, please check out my TED Talk, our Global Weirding series, and also that Chatelaine article I wrote about how do you have these tough conversations about climate change. Um, there's a quick question about how long does CO2 last in the atmosphere. Um, it lasts for decades to centuries. And that is why not only do we have to stop putting bricks on the pile, we have to figure out how to pull the bricks off the pile through everything from planting trees to new technology, which a BC company is actually pioneering, where they suck carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into liquid fuel. Um, Jim asks, Post-pandemic, what is your opinion on focusing mostly on the economy rather than how these things are connected? I think that that would be a huge mistake because they are all connected. If we rev up the economy based on fossil fuels, we're just going to end up in the same boat on climate change before we know it. And that's what the United States is mostly doing. Whereas in Canada, if we look at post-pandemic recovery based on climate accountability, which is what Canada is doing, then we are combining the issues to make sure we're looking at the big picture so we do not or at least we do our best to ensure that we do not end up in the same boat again. Um, how do we develop climate change education and work together between developing and developed countries? I love that question because uh, myself, I grew up um, uh, a lot of my time as a child in South America. So I know that when, when you don't even have enough food to eat, you don't even have a safe place to live, you can't even drink the water if you have water coming out of the tap at all. It's hard to even think about why does climate change matter? And that is why it's so important to talk about and to implement and to transfer the technology for solutions that both help people build resilience to the impacts of a changing climate through smart agriculture, through water filtration, through providing clean energy, as well as reducing potential carbon emissions. Just as we would not say to people, oh, if you want, if you want telephones, you should look into the party line telephone. Today, we'd say, no, everybody's got cell phones. In the same way, we need to leapfrog right over our energy technology to clean energy because everybody needs energy. And we need clean water. We need abundant food. We need safe places to live. But here's the thing. If we don't fix climate change, we're not going to have these things because climate change is a threat multiplier. <laughs>